Okay, we are live. Joined this hour by Ankur Patal. Uh, very, very excited. He is a teacher, a, a union organizer. Um, he's worn many hats over the, over the years. He can tell us all about it. Before we do that, though, Ankur, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how did you get started? When did you, how did you, uh, how did you become a teacher? Well, how did I become a teacher? Yeah. Uh, right out of uh, UCLA, my undergrad, I graduated in 2007 with a degree in ecology, behavior, and evolution. It's a plant animal discovery channel type of stuff, but economic collapse. Uh, really no jobs in that field at that time. And I found a job on Craigslist to teach English in South Korea. They paid for my uh, travel out there, uh, housing board, and it was an amazing experience. You know, 22, 21, 2008 to 2009, I spent in South Korea teaching English to Korean kids I taught. So that was my first experience as an actual teacher in a you know, professional setting career. But throughout high school, college, you know, tutoring here or there, whatever was going on, trying to help out in that way. But growing up with that education uh, mentality, I had the Indian parents who, you know, you were going to college, that wasn't a question, but at what level? What are you trying to do being a doctor, et cetera? So for me, that education thing has just always been in my blood. So teaching in South Korea, then after that, I ended up teaching in China for six months, really hustling. In Korea, I had a passport, I had the visa, I was legit with this one, uh, uh, private hagwon in China I was hustling off like the equivalent of Craigslist tutoring here or there I actually got caught by immigration in China in Beijing it's a big thing right 100,000 foreigners are teaching English illegally in Beijing and maybe that number is different now but every little while they do spot checks at different uh, English schools they pull up all their papers and uh, they call people like me who are teaching there illegally in for a little uh, question and answer session that was an interesting one. Um, I don't know if I might as well just tell the story, right? So oh, yeah, tell us, tell us what happened. Yeah. In, and I'm like, okay, what is this? It's immigration. I don't speak Chinese well. I had to get somebody else to translate. You got to show up at uh, the, the immigration bureau at this time, at this day, don't miss it. I show up, uh, they, they maybe can wait. They have me come in and I start noticing some other people that I thought I might've seen. And they just start drilling me on the questions. Why are you here? Were you working? Uh, uh, did you have any intention to work? Did you teach, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm denying it. And then all of a sudden they come coordinated with all the stacks of papers from the the school that I was, one of the schools I was teaching with, is this the, the pay sub that you signed? I'm like, oh, I guess uh, you got me. And they did this to like five or six other teachers at the same time from the school. And they basically have a sign a document in Chinese that says, I don't know what it says, just a regurgitation of the conversation. And that's like, they get the school I was teaching, it gets a fine slap on the wrist and they continue to teach English to people who are willing to pay. So that was a kind of a cool, scary experience, but they didn't kick me out. They just give me a little citation. The, the school I was working for maybe paid it and business as usual, you know, it keeps on operating. So I taught in uh, China, Korea, and then I came back to the States and I got my master's degree at CSUN and I ended up teaching as a graduate assistant, kind of a co-supporting Reverend James Lawson. You might know this guy civil discourse and social change, yeah. national sit-ins. So I got to be his graduate assistant at CSUN for a quarter uh, a semester. And that was a cool experience and always just pushing on this education thing. So in 2015, I ran for school board, LAUSD board district three, you know, we had a charter school prosecutor, uh, iPad kind of Democrat establishment, uh, school board member in it as a stepping stone. So I got into that race and it put me on the path to really figuring out how LAUSD is going and how I can improve the situation in the school district that gave me my education. Yeah. So, okay. So, so tell us about, um, tell us about your run. How'd it go? So I, I've actually ran for office three times in 2013 for city controller. Corruption has become institutionalized through lobbying and campaign contributions. So the position that's following the money should not be taking any money from all these corrupt forces. So I ran uh, kind of a symbolic campaign, didn't raise any money, like a thousand dollars of my own. And I ended up with like 18,000 votes, independent, nonpartisan. I ran as an independent in 2015. I ran for school board, took it more seriously, raised like $25,000. Uh, again, as an independent, tried to make the circle of political groups, neighborhood councils, parent groups, teachers union, whatever it was. 
and it was a it was a really interesting experience back then it was again 2015 so it was staggered so very low turnout and since then we've aligned to even year uh school board elections so that's changed the dynamics a lot and then in 2018 this last uh, time i ran for office i ran for state assembly so i had seen working for the school board even though i ran in 2015 for school board i didn't win but the guy who won scott schmerlson hired me after we had defeated the kind of charter school incumbent. So I got to work for this guy as his field organizer. And I was in Beaudry, that's the LAUSD headquarter building. I got to go to school board meetings. I got to go to, all, I mean, it was amazing seeing the difference of how a school board member and his staff is treated versus a teacher or a special ed aide or a bus driver or a different kind of staff person at a school site. And that was really eye-opening to me because I got to be in the, the meetings on the 24th floor and see how, you know, million, 10 million, $100 million contracts were doled out or what questions were asked. And so working for the school board member for two and a half years, still engaged, I saw an opportunity to run for state assembly in the West Valley, Assembly District 45, seeing how that incumbent was Matt DeBobne, one of these uh, charter school guys, but also taking money from payday lenders, used car dealerships. He actually wrote a piece of legislation to help use car dealerships, right? So like the sleaziest of the sleazy type of centrist corporatist Democrat. And I'm, I'm in a position to, you know, be out there and try to talk about important issues and represent the progressive movement, environment, healthcare. He's, you know, avoiding all the important issues we talk about. So I got in the race and I dem entered, right? In 2015, I was an independent and seeing how this was going to be a partisan race, right? Democrat, Republican, DR on the ballot, primary and all that. Uh, having worked with Luis Javier Rodriguez and his uh, uh, Green Party campaign for governor of California and other Green Party candidates running for Congress and all sorts of independents, it just finally, you know, after Trump won in 16, it's like there's two teams winning. If I'm, I'm not on one of these two teams, I'm in the peanut gallery. And so if I figured I was going to run, I'm going to give my best myself the best chance to win. And that was that process of them entering. And it was, you know, some of the accusations or, or attacks were pretty ridiculous. Oh, you worked for this guy who was once a Republican, Scott Schmerlson, who ended up being the school board member. The most pro-union guy you ever had, uh, actually was more of an independent and is now a Democrat. But just because I worked for him, even though I've never, you know, changed my opinions or ideas or views in terms of principled issues, I get smeared within the Democratic Party for having worked for a Republican. But I was able to have more conversation. People were at least willing to listen, open the door, and so I saw how that Dem enter really benefited uh, me in certain ways in that campaign for state assembly. And it was, and Matt DeBobde ended up getting me too'd. He resigned. There was a special election. So the, you know, different folks jumped in the race and it turned into a sprint for a special election. And I ended up not winning. I ended up getting like 13, 14% of the vote. The 19 year old Republican who worked at an ice cream shop ended up making the runoff. So that whole DNR thing, who's a Democrat, who's a Republican, when depending on how many people in the race and how those votes end up falling matters so much. It's, it's, it's rigged in so many different ways at each different level. We could talk about that. But I, I, it was overall, uh, I felt a good experience. I learned a lot. I met a lot of great people. And, um, you know, out of that, it really, you know, after losing another election, you know, the third time I've lost, it was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get myself back on the feet and et cetera? I ended up becoming a substitute teacher. So LAUSD over that summer after the, the primary, I filled out the paperwork, did all the testing, this and that. And I have been substitute teaching at LAUSD for the last, you know, it's been two years now, but this last one semester has been a wild one with the COVID. Um, and that has been an amazing experience going school to school, subject to subject, day by day. You don't know what you're going to, what class you're going to be, which grades you're going to have. And it's just been eye opening to actually be in the classroom with kids and then recognizing any five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute conversation, any poem that you uh, open somebody's eyes with, any conversation that you have can be the game changer can flip somebody's mind, can give them the ability or the opportunity to see their own potential. That's how I used to approach it, right? Substitute teaching, but that grinds you down. And, and two years in, it's like, kids, can you just sit in the seat for a little bit while I try to explain what we're doing and I want to work with you? And I've seen how my own optimism 
has has you know unfortunately degraded over the the two years of substitute teaching because I see these kids in dire situations not getting the resources they don't have the counseling to support them there are good teachers and there are bad teachers and um, I could get into all the different kinds of positions teaching that I've had at a school site with special ed kids uh, PE as a aide as a yeah. second teacher in a classroom yeah, what I want to ask you though first for that is, is, is uh, what were some of the the, the challenges uh, that the teachers are facing today in terms of um, the threat of, um, of you know, um, the charters and, and all sorts of things. Let's start with that, let's start with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of the charter schools, wow, the, the concept of choice has just been flipped, turned upside down, right? Uh, we know charter schools are more segregated, they're creaming, they're taking kids uh, uh, with certain qualifications and not other characteristics, demographics, special ed kids are notably not as uh, included in charter schools. So one of the schools that I've been teaching at uh, mostly is Olive Vista Middle School, and it was actually uh, co-located in the past. So there's this whole thing about co-location, where these charter schools are saying if a regular public school is not enrolled fully, right? They don't have, they're not using all their classrooms. They can come in and use those classrooms to run their operation. But Sometimes they're doing things like saying that music room or that computer lab or that dance room, things that are giving the flavor and the texture of education. They're trying to snatch that up and say, that's not being used, so you need to give it to us. So it's, it's, it's insidious at some levels, but then it's also that, look, there's a one charter school teaching Nahua, right? Indigenous language. I'm not trying to get rid of that charter school. There's no way LUSD is going to start running that program in any serious way. Are you it, talking about Samias? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you don't. I actually had Marcos on. Yeah, so, so there's this range of charter schools, and yeah. some of it is really nefarious, you know, in terms of just looking at kids as uh, of the called average right? daily attendance. So yeah. the amount of days that a kid spends in school is how the state allocates money to the school district. There's this complicated formula, you know, so they were just talking about huge budget cuts, right? At the state level, $50 billion. There's a whole formula within the state budget, uh, I think it's Prop 98, that then allocates a certain amount of those funds to school districts, K through 12 generally. Within that, we, uh, Jerry Brown had this local control funding formula that says school districts that have more uh, kids with special ed, foster uh, foster kids and poverty get more money uh, than other districts. So Beverly Hills is getting like 11,000 or $12,000 per kid. LAUSD is getting like $15,000 per kid um, because of the number of students in those categories from the state. But that's gonna be dramatically cut. I mean, we'll see how it all plays out. So in that way, the charter schools, they use their attendance to say, state, give me money. And then we know they're doing all sorts of funny business, right? They're giving contracts out to their own folks. They're not hiring proper teachers. They're squeezing teachers out once they start saying, no, you can't make me do parent-teacher nights on Saturdays and Sundays, whatever, right? So all that stuff is going on. And then at the same time, you have this whole other brand of charter schools. You have that independent created charter school where somebody files that petition and creates a charter school out of nowhere. You have the conglomerate corporate charter schools like the Green Dots and KIPP. They're like all, they're nationwide and they're really running it like a business. And then you have conversion charter schools. So you have things like Granada Hills High School and El Camino High School and uh, uh, Birmingham High School. I'm in the Valley, right? San Fernando Valley. So those are those are prominent, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 student high schools that were LAUSD full-on public schools, and then they converted to be independent charters. So these are huge, you know, thousands of student independent high schools now in the middle of this LAUSD network ecosystem of schools. And so it, it causes so many problems in the, the flow, right? The pattern of matriculation, where are the kids going, how are they being recruited out, who's being recruited out. So in, in so many different ways, charter schools are presenting a range of problems for traditional public schools, especially the Los Angeles Unified School District, which is not nimble, which is so huge, which has so many you know bureaucrats and downtown buildings and administrators working at, for overhead, um, but they can't, but, but a lot of our staff labor tax dollars is caught up there while charter schools are, are because they tend to be closer to the ground, even if they're funneling money they're, to their donors, to their um, special contractors, to their high salaries, they're still able to present this sense of your dollars are going straight back to you, 
to the community, to the parents, to the to the students in certain ways. So while it is a complicated conversation on charter schools and how, how they are being approved, what regulations they have, uh, the online aspect of it, they're called local education authorities. So in the California State Education uh, uh, Education Code, local education authorities are the governing bodies that are judged, are, are the, that's the governing body. So a school district is an LEA and then an individual charter school can be its own LEA if it applies that way. Now there's a one case, I think I think it's Wilson High School, I could be wrong about this, but there's a school where there's a charter school within the public high school, is that not yeah. right? That they're actually taking, they're actually taking physical, I, I'm not trying to use like, you know, academic language and say take up space. No, literally taking up real yeah. estate. I touched on that. That's in a public school, yeah. It's called co-location. It's a Prop 39 in 2000, I don't know, three, early 2000s. And it was a Trojan horse, right? Initially, it's like, oh yeah, we got wasted school space. Let's make more use of it. And before we knew what was up, it was their Trojan horse for charter schools and private, you know, profiteers, education profiteers to get in and take space, take physical location of, of school sites. And this has been going on. LAUSD has been the specific target of it and the victim of it. So yes, there are high schools, there are middle schools, there are elementary schools across the city where when a charter school sees vulnerability, they'll say, let's apply to get those 10 rooms over there. Let's apply to get those five rooms at that school over there. And then they're literally on the campus of an LAUSD public school. And sometimes they're competing for the same students. And sometimes at the same school that is co-located charter and the regular public school, guess what the demographics look like? Pretty different. Yeah. So are they are they paying for the are they paying for the the, the toilet paper or are they paying for the? the, uh, I, the we're paying for it. Yes, yes, that's a great question. So depending on the school board majority, right? There's seven school board members, and depending on the school board majority, they're putting people into positions in the charter school division. LAUSD is so huge, right? 500, 600,000 students, you know, 30,000 teachers, 30,000 other employees, they've got a whole charter school division. So the head of the charter school division, if the school board majority is pro-charter, is going to make it easier for charter schools to get that co-location. If the school board majority is kind of more on the public school side and opposed to charter, they're going to make it harder for that charter school to get that. Uh, and then the personnel is how it happens. I was actually in a co-location meeting at, uh, I don't know, NDA, whatever, Columbus High, Columbus Middle School, Christopher Columbus Middle School in Canoga Park. They're co-located, right? And so I'm in this meeting with one of the LAUSD people who's saying, yeah, you should give them this room and this room and this room because they had some open rooms and they're, that's the dance, right? They're negotiating. Should we give them this room or that room? And the principal's like, but I, I need those rooms. I'm using those rooms. Here are other rooms we set aside that will be fine. And this guy from the district is out here saying, no, but you should give them these rooms because that's what they wanted. But because I was in that meeting working for a school board member who was pushing back on it, I was able to just stand up and say, no, we're going to go with our principal here and we're not going to give these. And then it had to go to a rigmarole who said who it had to go up to the board member and it comes back. OK, fine. Our school, our gets to keep the rooms that they want. Did you slam your fist on a table or like wave any papers in the air when you said it? Nah, brother. When you're in these in these places, sometimes <laughs> you gotta wear the suit and tie. You gotta look the part. I, I, ah, I, but... you, can, you, you can slam your fist in a, uh, in a suit and tie. Yeah, yeah. That's you actually like, loosen sounds your good. Tie, you know? like, yeah, it's <laughs> the kids deserve more. I mean, yeah. they do. It's, it's nuts. Like, no, like no, no, literally no. the charter school is getting the prime spots and we went into this building and they got storage and they got closets and they're using all this space for parent space. And then the, 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 the regular school kid, right, that used to have a home econ kind of program, right? So there's one, one classroom with um, washer and dryers. Like that's the, the, the rooms that have washer and dryers that are not particularly conducive to the kind of curriculum that they're trying to teach goes to the regular school and the brand new classrooms that are renovated go to the charter school. That's, that's, that's what that co-location thing is doing. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's hard. It's, they got it into law through that proposition 39. And there's lots of, you know, each time it comes up, it, it depends on the community, if they can organize, if they can fight, if they can, and, and depending on if it's citizens of the world charter school, which is 
way capable of bringing their lobbyists and a bus full of kids and their uniforms or in the same shirts and have coherent message and then they get the space because the opposition on our side isn't able to organize in that same capable what they can't pay somebody to organize their family and their community to go defend their space this sounds it's, it's something that you've heard again and again but yeah it's it's going on in LAUSD on a regular basis Sorry, I, I cut out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, this is this is like really fascinating. Um, uh, so tell us about who are some of these just, just different players. I, I've heard of Green Dot, but I've never heard of Citizens of the World. That one, that's a new one to me. It's a smaller one. I mean, th there's like 200 different charter schools within uh, LAUSD, and they're they're competing with each other. Kip is a big one, right? Knowledge is a power plan, or, or and uh, plus uh, public public school Los Angeles. I mean, there's like dozens and dozens of five to 10 schools that are charter schools and they're con connected to each other to the California Charter School Association. So they got their lobbying organization. The California Charter School Association is a statewide uh, charter school lobbying organization and any every charter school network or school is paying dues to them, right? And folks like Reed Hastings, folks like the Bloombergs and the Bill Gates are loading up million, five million, $10 million contributions to the charter, California Charter School Association so that they can spend million, two million, five million dollars in school board races and then get more charter schools approved so that their membership grows and they gain power. I mean, it's, they've got a plan and it's working. So tell us about, tell us about the Green Dot. That's like kind of the biggest one, right? I, yeah, man. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, the way that these charter schools work is it's it's not even too different than a regular school it's just in-house right they got their own board of directors they got their own people that they're uh, kicking work to and they're trying to run it like a business right and then you have good people you have good teachers good human beings who think let me try this and this is my job and i'm in it for the kids and i'm not gonna worry about the charter school politics and, and they continue to, to function, operate, and, you know, some kids get good results out of it. What are you going to do about that? It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not on the kids. It's not on the teachers. It's this broader political and uh, economic incentives that have created these structures that pit us against ourselves in terms of our public education system. Yeah. So I saw this movie one time called Waiting for Superman. Oh, yeah. Are you telling me Different that Maggie, Canada. Are you telling me that Maggie Gyllenhaal is a liar? <laughs> Uh, I mean, people got good intentions. They, you know, they don't go the right way sometimes. Uh, and it depends on what information you have, and right, like, because I you, saw you, that she she just cared about her kid. And she just wanted the best. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes, how are you gonna fault people for that? You know, uh, uh, Huffman can spend uh, the couple of ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars <laughs> to get their kids. Into, how can you blame her? I don't know. There's there's a whole range of that. When you see the, the, the African American homeless woman who puts in the wrong address or, or tries to get her kid into a uh, into a little bit better public school, she faces faces five years in jail, right? So that kind of um, different perception bias, realization, experience of the education system is one hundred percent right, and and that's the strength of the charter school movement. They've basically created this whole narrative where if you're a parent who cares about your kid. If you're not trying to put them in a charter school, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. You're, if, you, if you don't have the money to put them in a private school, then this is your only other alternative. They've created the narrative. They've developed it. And, you know, the, the neoliberal Democrats have bought into it. And they accept it because it means they, they get a better education for their kids. So, so the, idea, the idea is that the, uh, the public schools are, are kind of falling apart and crumbling and they're, they're no good. And uh, they typically blame by teacher unions this yeah and, yep. uh, and so it's usually a pretty right wing like you know like if we didn't have to pay these damn teachers so much for whatever then there'd be like more textbooks and pencils for your kid right so that's not really the problem is it not at so, all okay <laughs> illuminate us Ooh, man the, the problems are so deep and they, they it just becomes the weakest link in the chain, right? When you have 
12 years of education that a kid is supposed to go through. You get one bad teacher or one teacher who's given up or one person who got in there that shouldn't have been or one mismatch between a kid and a teacher because they don't, you know, uh, resonate or a kid gets placed in the wrong class because of some sort of learning uh, issue. Uh, it just ends up becoming exponentially worse. Every year, the kid is falling further and further behind. And I've been mostly at middle school. And you, I see kids in sixth, seventh, sixth grade who can't read, right? The, the basic math is not there. And it's, it's not the middle school teacher's fault at this place in time. It's the whole system leading up from this kid in potentially, right? The whole push has been pre-K. We got to get the kids in pre-K even sooner so that they don't start with a million word deficit so that they get socialized right. So how far back does it go? And, and then it becomes, you've got too many kids in the class. You've got uh, bad materials. You've got old materials. You still got Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492, right? You've got so much ridiculous stuff. And then you've got teachers who are trying to engage their kids and give them the personal attention that they need. And it's such a complicated, you need the nurse to work, you need the counselor to work, you need the psychiatrist to work, you need the, the lunch and the breakfast to be on, you need the, the kid to have a home life where they can have the space to do homework and read. All of these things need to go right but in, in so many cases, it's, it's not just one domino that, it's not just one piece that's yeah. missing, it's several. And then, and then it's, what, what's the teacher gonna do, right? The teacher's in this situation with 30, 40 kids like this. You're, you're, and, and the amount of time that we have is just not enough, right? We have 180 days of school in a year. That's the days of instruction. And then that's broken out. We got shooter drills. We got earthquake drills. We got waste of time drills. We got testing over here. We got kids being absent. When a teacher's absent, I come in as a sub and you can see the teachers who care, they give you the good plan and you're not missing a beat and the teachers that don't. And that's one of those things where we on the left got to realize every teacher isn't a great teacher, but that doesn't mean we need to fire them or throw them out. One of my best experiences as a teacher, and I'm a sub, right? I didn't, I haven't been in a classroom. I haven't prepared years and years of material and, and have my routine down. But I got to teach as a resource specialist. So I had my own case and it was a long-term assignment. I had my own case of like 28 kids with IEPs, right? Individual education plan. And I'm following them around in classes where they're clumped together. So for like math, these six kids are in this math class and they all have IEPs. So I'm in that class helping them. And I'm working with the other teacher because that teacher knows that these kids have IEPs and now it's our collective responsibility and I'm helping the other kids as well. But then I've seen in that same situation where I have a good teacher and I'm able to work with them and help the kids and there's a lot of progress. I could have a bad teacher where all of a sudden I have to be the lead, right? How, how is this guy or this lady or this, this person the lead teacher with all these kids and all of a sudden they, they're rude to the kids. They're talking back to the kids. They're being, they're not respecting, they're being mean, right? I see that and I feel that all the time and it becomes contagious. The kids feel like the teachers don't care about them sometimes and then they give it back and then they don't care about each other as fully. And then that, that whole atmosphere turns into not a place of knowledge and wisdom and higher aspirations, but they're middle school kids, right? That's, it becomes hormones and who's cool and who can have fun and make me funny. So, so, so my personal opinion is that the public school system should be hit with a consent decree. That's there are it. a lot of consent decrees. I, no, we I, just no, got I, over I, one that was for like special the ed. Hit, the one that hit the LAPD back in the 90s. So that the LAPD has to like look like the community or whatever. Has to, you know, like, so you look at like how they are representative of people that go there, right? Yeah. People are ple pleasing. Didn't change much with LAPD, but I think it would change a lot more in LAUSD. So my personal opinion is that yeah no you, you know people do need to, people do need to be phased out or, or they need to be 15 year plan so that the demographics of the of the school you know the, the, the students looks like the demographics of the teachers right so i think that would be the number one thing because honestly for me school was a horrible racist experience and it it was the entire time it, 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 and it just it just it just never it, there was no point in time was my schooling experience not racist it was racist the whole time I mean, constantly had my question my, my intelligence questioned constantly it was a constant like you know idea that, that Mexicans are this way and I, everyone in my family had the same, exact, same experience so this is not something that's unique right so and most of my friends have the exact same experience so this is a very common thing so I personally think that, that that that'd be the, the thing to do How, well, but, but that's a different question than like 
yeah, public schools have problems. So let's union bust. I mean, that has not, like, that's not. Yeah, no, that, that's just their alter, ulterior political motives to yeah. undermine uh, any any form of collective action for the common good, which starts with knowledge and wisdom, right? Yeah. So education, if we don't learn the mistakes of the past, we're going to repeat them. If we don't know why the oppressor is dominating us now, they're going to continue to oppress us. And we don't know about the, 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 the imposition of their language and the destruction of our cultural history, we're going to continue to suffer those, right? The other, other position that I'm, I'm do, I'm, I have right now is I'm the director of advancement for Hindu University of America. So this has been a cool perspective. And, and for you, I totally understand where that racist feeling in public education, I feel it, I see it. You know, I've also met some of the coolest European American teachers who put the old world map on the wall and say, that's what this world was before we destroyed it and created the new world on top of it, right? So I have, I know, and I respect some European American teachers who do teach real history. But yeah, I totally understand that your experience and, and that those are few and far between, right? No doubt about it. There needs to be systematic change to include that kind of versus what we get. And that, that the, just that one point that she honed in on is they disrespect your intelligence. This is a cross-culture society. It's not just the teachers at this one school disrespecting this one Mexican kid's intelligence. It's systematically, culturally, the media, the, the government, like, like they don't believe that we're smart enough to realize that they're lying to us. And that trickles all the way in and out through public education and higher education at every single level. Yeah. Definitely. No, definitely. And, and that and that's and it's not an individual experience. But like, so I mean, that's just my that's just my idea, you know, because I'm very, you know, so I anyone watching this, that was me. That wasn't Ankur. That was me that said that. That's not everyone's got to lose their. <laughs> but um, but no, but that, but no, but really, I think that that's really that, that's the answer because like um, as as much as like members of the in group or the out whatever you're, you're, the group that you're a part of, the subgroup, the, the your ethnicity, your race, ethnicity, as much as they can perpetuate bad ideas about you, it's almost never as bad. It's almost yeah. never. As bad. It's almost yeah. never as directly bad as like as, as getting that from from um, somebody who's coming from 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 a different perspective and and tell and basically question your intelligence in a place where you're supposed to like demonstrate your ability to learn right and so like that is a, a constant so i i really feel as though if there was uh i'm not saying the problem would disappear i'm not saying that what problem wouldn't would, these problems would still occur i'm just saying the intensity of the problem uh would lessen dramatically it would lessen dramatically and and not in a one-to-one -one gate and not in a one-to-one Scenario, but yeah. over across the board, the situation would lessen dramatically. I mean, and so like that is kind of that's where I'm coming from with that statement. But at the same time, the fact that there are problems in public school, the fact that there are disengaged teachers, the fact that there are openly hostile teachers, the fact that there are some teachers who just like want to be teachers, like even getting taking away the the the, the ethnic or even a, or a gender component, they just want to be bullies to like people who can't fight back, right? That, that you see that too. The fact that these things happen does not indicate we should union bust hundred percent hundred percent and on the flip side uh, more to not and, and that's the thing i don't want to blame right that's part of the problem it's easy to blame somebody else for our collective failures because they're a collective failure there's blame to go around but parents are dropping the ball also right the parents who are following up with the teachers and trying to get assignments makes a big difference versus the teacher who's reaching out to a parent saying, dude, your kid threw something at me in class of the day and then didn't turn in the assignment and then stopped us from learning, et cetera. And the, and the parent takes the kid's side and then yells at the teacher. This happens on a regular basis, regular basis. This is a lunchtime conversation in every teacher lounge. You know, regardless of if there's a good teacher or a bad teacher, every teacher has so many experiences with parents who don't support the learning uh, uh, atmosphere. And, and is that cold? Is it because it's they're working two jobs? Is it because they're, they're stuck in poverty? Is it because of the, the, the racism that they felt and they're just channeling and they can't get away from their substance, whatever, right? There's a whole range of things that cause family life to then uh, impact school life in a way that is, is ignored compared to the teachers. And, and it, it's, it's not even close, right? A family, uh, I mean, it, 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 anything could be close. The, uh, who knows what individual person is going to flip that switch for a kid, right? You never know who that's going to be, where it's going to happen, when it's, how it's going to happen. Yeah. 
And it, it's just about, and so my big idea, my big idea is on education and how do we actually get it is, is we need to reimagine public education instead of teaching the curiosity out of us, right? Instead of rote memorization and, and all the things that we know is wrong and the testing and, and we need to open it up so that kids have more choice. At Ola Vista Middle School, the kids get to fill out a survey about some of the electives that they want in the next quarter and not even half the kids get the elective that they want. We're not even working hard, hard enough to get the kids elected that they want. Forget about the science, the math, the English, what books are they reading? And, and, and I saw it where in, in one English class, this teacher is teaching refugee. I don't know if you, if you heard about this book, but it is amazing. It tracks the story of three middle school, like 12, 13 year old refugees at different times. One Holocaust, one Syrian refugee, one uh, Cuban refugee, right? And their stories kind of parallel, they're different, but over you know, the 40s, the 60s and, uh, and 2000s, right? Three different stories. And this teacher is like engaging these kids in this awesome conversation that's relevant and, and has all these real world consequences and, and, get, and it's just beautiful to see. And even though you have a couple of knuckleheads not paying attention, but the vast majority understand and can connect it to the world around them. And this other teacher's doing the Velveteen Rabbit. Right. And, 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 you know, I was trying to pull on some of those connections, but I, you're not going to make that same level of, of, of depth. You're not going to have that understanding of what's going on in the world when you're on this. And, and it's the same grade, different teachers using different materials. Right. It, it doesn't sometimes it doesn't matter if it's a charter school or public school, if it's this school or that school, or if it's this classroom next to this classroom, what's going on can be so different. We need to give kids, parents, the education community more choice in terms of what we want to learn, when we want to learn, learn it, and how we want to learn it, right? When kids are engaged and curious, they're going to go and learn about it. They're going to read up and do research. They're going to figure it out. But when you're forcing the same thing down their throats and it doesn't connect, and it, 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 I don't even want to teach it, right? Sometimes when you're like, well, why are we even here teaching this? And, and it, 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 it's hard for the, the teacher to get in there and say, Sorry, sorry, kids. I know this is boring, but this is what we're supposed to learn today. When are you empowered enough to change that whole equation and dynamic? It's not going to happen unless we come out of this, you know, this pandemic portal in, in, a, in a new way and looking at education, right? Again, looking at that K through 12, 180 days a year, we're not looking at it as a continuum of education. And, and the standards are there and it should be, but oftentimes it's all cut up. It's not scaffolding. It's not building on what you did last year and uh, creating a whole context of a worldview. It's choppy piecemeal facts and factoids. And there's just, a, I, I feel a general lack of appreciation of that fundamental search for the universal knowledge, wisdom, and, and, and that's starting early in our kids because these kids in society wants us to make money. And that's the only thing that matters. Right. Fundamentally, that's a big shift that needs to happen in public education. What is the purpose of public education? We need to uh, have that conversation with the kids. And I try to do that. Right? I get into my, my my speech with the kids like. Yeah, I got lots of speeches what, to get into. With what, kids. What, <laughs> it's fine. What has been what has been your experience migrating all your teaching to, to the online? How, how, how have you felt, dealt with that and how have some of your fellow teachers dealt with it? So I'm as a sub, they're not having me teach online. So I'm not plugging in for teachers. So I, I'm not. I haven't been subbing online, but I, I have, I'm on some group chats. My sister-in-law is an eighth grade science teacher. I got to sit with her for a couple, you know, two days and watch her uh, interact with her kids. And it, it's, it's, it's just exacerbating the divide. It's just exacerbating the divide. Even as, so the last day that I worked was March 13th. That's when we shut down. We 12th, March 12th, we knew we gave the kids permits, waivers, you know, Fill this out, bring it if you need a computer. And on March 13th, we're handing computers out to kids to try and give them, you know, tech so that we expect this distance learning to go on and, and they need tech. So just that first barrier, you've heard about it. I think LUSD did an okay job, but you got some, some kids in schools giving bunk ass iPads that don't even have the app that you need, can't download. And it's like more frustrating to, to pound your head against the, the iPad that's you know, overpaid for, under-delivered, doesn't have been a piece of paper and a pencil and a worksheet. 
So it's like, the, again, the focus gets taken off of learning and to all these other shiny objects this way and that way. And so teachers are having difficulty just keeping that regular, you know, schedule of kids taking an assignment, doing it, turning it in. But then the whole second level of rigor of actual comprehension and understanding is totally out the window. Now it's just barely, can I even get kids to turn something in, give them some feedback, see if they can get it right. And then the whole aspect of educating, learning, having that conversation online, people are figuring it out. And honestly, I, I think I think the kids are falling as, as a whole, I think everyone's falling behind, but I think the the divide is definitely is, is widening, right? The, the, the parents who can get tutoring are getting tutoring. The parents who are doing music lessons are now doing the music lessons on, on Zoom and still getting it. Uh, if they need, the, right, that's still going on. And that same lack of support is still going on, except even higher now because the kids aren't even at school. You can't have them stay after school for tutoring. You can't pull them out for a counseling session. You can't have that one-on-one -on -one with them on, on, on some, that kind of regular because they're at home now. and. I, I it, it is it is it's a little scary to think about what level of graduate we were producing before and 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 the way that it's it's going now. I mean I went through a magnet program, so I got a huge bubble experience, right? I was I was pulled out and I had all these other kids were motivated. And, and it was just the tale of two schools, right? Yeah. My experience was completely different than yours and so many other people's, but that's still going on today. It's, it hasn't changed. And, and, you know, everyone has their unique educational experience, but we're not doing enough to engage the kids in their own creativity and encourage and respect their intelligence, right? Like, and sometimes when I have a small class, say a uh, teacher went on a field trip and only had like five or six kids, I try to dig in with that, right? What do you want to be? What is your favorite subject? Has anybody talked to you about this? Did you know? And, and these kids have never even had that conversation with their parents or a counselor or anybody. And me as a sub, I can get into that conversation sometimes with a kid here and there. And they, they remember me. They come back. Oh, I, I went to Pierce College and I looked up this course. It seems right. You know, I want to be a vet. Here's a pathway to that. I want, and, and that's the other aspect. People aren't incurred, right? That respecting intelligence. Even if I don't think a kid is going to pass the LSAT or the MCAT, I still say, you know, you, you should try and be a doctor or a lawyer if that's what you want. These are the paths to do it. You got to try and fulfill it. And that kind of encouragement, I don't even get from my own parents, you know? So it's, it's one of those things where I feel a lot of kids are missing on that. And the school system doesn't give it at that level that it should because that level of confidence and self-worth is invaluable. And that's what we need to be doing in our public school systems. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned something about uh, doing like, uh, you're also involved in, uh, uh, in an organization called Hindu Schools or what was it? Yeah, Hindu University of America. So like, there's been a systematic effort by Europe to marginalize, disrespect, undermine all cultures, right? All indigenous across. But what they did in India and South Asia to the Hindu people was particularly amazing because they learned Sanskrit to interpret the text and tell us what they mean, right? And they perverted it to this level where all these straw man arguments about caste and oppression and violence, caste is a Portuguese word, you know? It comes from, it's not even part of our, we had different concepts of, you know, the family and the tradition that you're born into and a whole, you know, 30,000 job classification uh, jati system. And, and of course, they simplify it to this was a tool that the Brahmins used to oppress everyone. So therefore, it's better if we take over. Right. And, and so some of that gaslighting from the European intellectuals and academia is is manifest throughout all levels of education. And you, you know about indigenous people, about African American people in this country, the textbooks don't reflect the real history and Hinduism is no different, no different at all. And so with the last time I ran for office, right, state assembly, I didn't win, but part of what came out of that was this recognition of my own faith, my belief uh, uh, and uh, appreciation for the history, uh, the, the Vedic philosophy and, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in any culture's 
history that I got connected to mine and I try to recruit, you know, initially to get votes, to raise money, to try and win a seat of political office. But then I got plugged more and more in and maybe you, we could have a good conversation about this. This is definitely interesting. I got plugged into some of those uh, different Hindu organizations uh, and I went to the World Hindu Congress in 2018 that was kind of protested against by some leftists because some conservative uh, Hindus were invited and had prominent roles. So Tulsi Gabbard dropped out, uh, Rokhana dropped out, some other you know folks, Hindus showed up and spoke and I got to see and be there in person to see this complicated existential kind of conflict discussion between different belief systems and what it means and how you interpret what, you know, your history is your history. Other people have their history. Depending on which side of the coin you're on, you're gonna see it differently. So out of that, I got recruited by some of the folks working on Hindu University of America. It actually started, originally founded IDEA in 89, got recognized in the state of Florida in 93, had some ups and downs. Uh, I was brought on board this last year. We're kind of in a rejuvenation phase where we're really trying to uh, represent Hinduism in the West, right? From a Hindu perspective. We got so many European Americans teaching hot yoga without any of the, the background, you know, real understanding of what's going I, on. I shouldn't laugh. I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh. It's just, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. I mean, it's-, it's, it's I admit that more, to be funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, more, it's one of the more ridiculous things you see, like when they, when they, when they ring the bells, especially- it's not even so much the 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 um just my perspective it's, it's not so much the the stretching and the the moving around because you know it's kind of just like you know it's just move your body kind of calisthenic or whatever but the the bell when they start doing the bell and they start like <laughs> like you know that, that that's so ridiculous I, and and so seeing how ayurveda right the intellectual property that we have taken for granted now is being appropriated by capital and capitalism to make money we're like, wait a second. And then Hindus in America are well off, right? Tech, we, we, but where does our money go? It often goes to mandirs and temples and it goes into all sorts of different kind of projects and investments, et cetera. But this kind of Hindu University of America has inspired me in a lot of ways. I learned so much over this last year about the real history of you know, colonization and conquest and how, that, uh, how they systematically destroyed our entire education system and forced us to learn English and use that as a marker for success, right? As class, right? They, 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 they imposed caste on their, their form of caste on us and then used English on top of it to say, you can raise up in the societal structure if you learn English while undermining our own you know, indigenous cultures, traditions, and calling it backwards, or, or, or and taking and separating it out, separating the good parts and 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 the mythology and some of the other stuff, and saying all that bad stuff is Hindu, and all that good stuff, yeah, we're gonna take it, <laughs> and then you don't it's get any credit culture. for it. Yeah, it's just, it's just world culture. It's just part of like, you yeah, know, yeah, what it means to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the the diamond and the queen's jewel in the, in the crown, or the the British museums of of Egyptian relics and. Oh, it's, it's amazing. They've never apologized. There's been no reparations. I mean, that's what I really feel is part of this Hindu University of America and in my own recognition of world history, right? When was World War I? It was in 1914 to 1919. World War I was when uh, uh, after Constantinople fell and the Pope declared their, their papal bulls of doctrine of discovery to say, we as European Christians can go take your land, your people, subjugate in the name of, and, and wage war, war on six continents. And guess what? They won. That was World War I. They won. They rewrote the history books and convinced us when they were fighting amongst themselves for who's in charge of the rest of the world between 1914 and 1945, that was the world wars. Right, they manipulated the whole framework of the history. And the first AP class I took in high school was AP European history, not by accident, right? When you prioritize and put an importance on a certain history over others, it becomes part of the, the consciousness and it perpetuates. And that's what I feel Hindu University of America is challenging. And I'm, I'm learning, we're online, 100% online. We have Sanskrit, we have a master's of Sanskrit program, and that is such a powerful language. There's like 30 million Sanskrit manuscripts compared to like 10,000 Greek manuscripts, right? Con compared the, the, the voluminous nature of 
of knowledge and wisdom in the Hindu culture that was burned down first by Islamic conquest, right? And then purposely destroyed by uh, uh, European colonization, right? It wasn't by accident, right? And, and so bringing that all together, I think Hindu University of America and, and the whole word Indian, what a trip Indian, right? Like they come over here, they call the native people indigenous, they try to wipe them out and erase them with not just violence, but culturally with their language, systematically disrespect. And then why are we Indians? That's another one that they came up with us on before that even on the wrong side of things. But then we accept it, right? We accept it, we own it, we take control of it. And I, I hope there's you know room for solidarity and growth to recognize indigenous cultures across the world brown and black, I mean, African-Americans, South Americans, right? The mind, all of us together need reparations at a global scale. It's not just, you know, the United States of America needs to give African-Americans reparations 100%, 110%. But what about the transatlantic slave trade, right? They gotta be, somebody gotta be reparated. What about France and Haiti, right? That, like the, all this stuff that you and I kind of know, we've done research, we've explored and, as, you know, getting older, not even a drop of this is in our history in public school. No. That's no. what we need to change. So yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think it was, what was it, Edward Gibbon or it was one of these guys, he said something like the whole, the whole of Hindu literature is not worth one bookshelf of Western, the Western canon. Yeah, like, are you kidding me? How are you gonna say that? James Mill, right? Racist. Churchill. Oh my God, the quotes coming out of Churchill was so racist and vile, but yet he's still idolized because he did, you know, he, he, he led. <laughs> he, said, he said some nice things, right? No doubt. He was a, but he didn't meet him. You know, he didn't meet him for brown and black people. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Uncle, it's been, it's been a great hour. Is there any, um, is there anything you think we should know about the, the fight to, to, Say public education in general or the fight to, to uh, some kind of fight that we can think we can yeah, get. Yeah, so uh, with LAUSD specifically, right, in November, we're going to have three school board seats up for election. Two are contentious. In the West Valley, we have Board District 3, where the incumbent Scott Schmerls, and that's uh, the board member I used to work for, is facing Marilyn Koziatek, who is kind of like an outreach, I forgot her exact title, marketing at Granada Hills Charter High School. So the, and there was a primary before those two made the runoff, and this is going to be a big race, millions and millions of dollars. The the balance that seven uh, board member, this is the one seat. This is going to be a four three, one way or the other. The majority is that charter school division guy going to come in and give the this class to the charter school, or are they going to give it back to the public school? It depends on who wins this race. So Scott Schmerlson is the side that I'm on. I mean, Marilyn Cosi she's a nice lady, but she's on the charter school side of things. So that's just the, the politics of it. In the Charter School Association is going to line up millions of dollars in support of her. So that's an important one. And then uh, Board District 7, that's kind of the South Bay San Pedro. We get past Patty Castellanos. That's who I'm supporting. I've actually also got this other thing called FixLAUSD.com. Right now we have seven school board members for, you know, five, 600,000 students, 4 million people in the city of LA, right? It's like LAUSD actually encompasses non-LA city, uh, only seven school board members. It's so unrepresentational. It's so hard to get a hold of your school board member. The school board member doesn't even have the capacity to pay attention to all the schools in their district. And it allows the bureaucracy and the inertia of, uh, of the, the, the bureaucracy to just run things as opposed to if we had a people powered movement to elect folks like us into these offices to then implement and bring some of this conversation and change to public schools, that would be a big difference. And obviously having smaller districts means individual votes matter more. Teachers, parents, individual votes matter more and those big campaign contributions uh, won't buy the election. So I think that's an interesting idea to, to get, off, get after in terms of increasing the number of school board members to make the school district more representational and accountable to local community and power. And so I've got that thing going on, fixlausd.com. That's gotta be a, a, a piece of legislation at the state level because it's the state of California that charted the existence of LAUSD in the first place. But that's that's one of those projects that I'm working on. Matt, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for uh, having this conversation. Yeah, um, appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. We'll, we'll, we'll talk again more and uh, drop the links below.
so people can connect. Cool.